now, starting at show host and filling in for me, a 6-2 candidate for the House of Delegates, wearing district number 93. He's not a tax and spender. He's a Mike Lovin' message sender. He's stared down dictators, and he's called the bluff of music industry regulators. From Martinsburg, he is in Bombway, Michael Horgan! Good morning, everybody. I'm Mike Hornby. I'm hosting today for Rob. He's taking another day off. I, I, I think he's got too many vacation days. Uh, but welcome in. We're going to have a lot of fun today. I am joined by co-host Mr. Stubblefield. Good, Good morning, Mike. I, I need an introduction like you have there. You know, when Rob made that, it, it, it just tickled me pink. <laughs> and I, I'll play it every time I can. <laughs> also joining us, the Queen of Martinsburg, <laughs> Miss Maria Lawrenson. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to be here. Yeah, um, Bill certainly should have that kind of intro because he's, do something he's for him. so regular. As a guest, I mean, <laughs> not, he might be regular well, you know, that way be, too, yeah. but um, as a guest host, but I get nothing as a, it's just a Wednesday. Oh, you but, get universal applause and appreciation. Well, and Maria. I told you about the guy who stopped me in the park. Yeah. Actually, it was Terry Walker. Terry, if you're listening, hi. Um, I was walking this past week and he said, is that Maria Lawrence? And I listened to you faithfully on Wednesdays. And I'm like, who is, I didn't recognize him because he had a straw hat and sunglasses. And then he told me who he was and. You know, so I didn't realize the reach that this show got around, around our community. I go to the grocery store. Right. And you're just walking down the aisle and somebody will come up and say, hey, Mr. Hornby, how are you? I've see, I seen yeah. you on TV. I've seen you on the radio. And I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea who this person is. Yeah. But, though I've seen you. What's you? And, you know, they'll have some comment about Bill or about Rob or, or something like that. It, it's really cool. Yeah. I was at a funeral not long ago and the gentleman parking the car recognized me. <laughs> and he said, they said, man, I don't know how, and, and Larry Schultz did not object to this. Said, I don't know how you put up the Larry Schultz. <laughs> the other guys are good, but Larry's too extreme for me. <laughs> but you're right. They, uh, there's a far reach. Yeah. And, and I think we have a sense, we who follow on Facebook, right. TV 10, the live feed, you think it's those folks, but it's a lot more. No, than it's, those it's folks. a lot more. And yeah. I think our radio audience is, is far yeah. bigger than, mm -hmm. than, than we give credit for sometimes. Right. Joining us in the first segment Who is. thought she was going to be ignored because yeah. we've been talking <laughs> no. about her so long. We can never okay. ignore her. And, and she is. Uh, made uh, my time down in the, in the Capitol a lot easier. I've done a lot of work with her. Uh, her office door is always open, and I, I thank you for that. We are joined by Senator Patricia Rucker. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Patricia, obviously you have an opponent this November. You just went through a, a pretty close race with, with uh, Paul uh, Espinosa. How do you tackle this uh, race coming up in November? Okay, well, um, as you guys know, because we were on last week, um, my opponent in the general mm -hmm. and I um, actually get along pretty well, talk regularly. We've organized and planned um, two debates between him and I that we're very grateful the Stubblefield Institute is going to be, I guess you'd say, sponsoring. Hosting. Hosting, yeah. sponsoring, yeah. I'm not sure what the right word is. Yeah. And they, um, I'm definitely looking forward to that because it's going to be an opportunity to go more in depth into where we stand on issues and just communicate um, better with folks in our district. So I really hope folks show up for that. But in terms of the strategy, I mean, I hate to say I'm boring, but I'm always pretty much... I campaign on the issues. I work really hard. I love going door to door, um, getting to talk to as many uh, voters as I possibly can. Um, and I've, that's just the way I've always focused. I do not do negative campaigning. I don't attack. Uh, that's not, I don't feel, the way that you really should make a decision as to whether you support someone is to how well they attack the other person. I mean, that's right. just crazy to me. At least for myself, when I vote, I look at where the person stands on the issues. Do they align with my values and principles and my opinions? And, you know, I hope folks will do the same. 
No. Yeah, uh, Patricia, you say you do not do negative campaigns, and very few candidates do negative campaigns, but many candidates have PACs that do the negative campaigns for them. And uh, we see this at the, at certain the national level, see it on the, uh, the statewide level. Unfortunately, it's become to the more local level as well. We saw it in the Craig Blair, the Tom Willis, and, and you alluded uh, last time you spoke that you were the victim of negative campaigns. I am not in your district. I did not see that. What can we do to control these negative PAC campaigns? It's e excuse me, before you say, it's easy for you, and you're not the only one. Everybody says the same thing. I don't do negative campaigns, and technically you do not, but there are a lot of negative campaigns done on the behalf of you and, all, and many other politicians. So, again, I just want to say those are not candidate PACs. They're independent expenditure PACs. And uh, it is part of freedom of speech that folks can um, align together, create associations, create PACs in order to, you know, have a say when it comes to elections. Um, those, those PACs, those associations, it is protected speech. Having said that, there have been occasions in which um, some of them have been sued because they have not been truthful. It, it's been flagrant. The problem lies in the fact that most of the um, the onus is going to be on the candidate who is maligned, and you must have money yeah. <laughs> to have a lawsuit and to and to sue um, for that. But in terms of what we can do about it, I mean, I I will tell you the number one thing is. Stop paying attention to it because the reason that these PACs are using those strategies is because unfortunately it works. There are unfortunately many voters who will decide who they vote for based on those sins, even though in general they're mostly untrue and mostly lies. Um, but what can you do other than ask voters to be educated and to actually do their own research? I think that's really... That's, yes, that's easy to say, but very difficult to do because there's information coming from all different sides, social media. And uh, the flyers. And the, the flyers, flyers were just yeah. um, crazy. Well, well oh, that is their number one tool is, yeah. the, you know, direct mail. But I will tell you, so, yes, it is difficult to do. When I started the Tea Party all of those years, way back ago, oh, feels like an ancient history, my kids are still small, mm -hmm. um, it was with the goal of giving more opportunity for the community to have ways to know who the candidates were and be informed voters. And we would host workshops and forums and um, provide educational opportunities. Did a, We've always done a booth at the fair to give out information, give candidates from all sides because it's bipartisan to be able to have an opportunity to talk to folks about their opinions having said that you can't force people to show up you can't force people to listen you can't force people to look there are opportunities i mean wrnr hosts forum so does the wepms the journal often does forums other organizations folks could show up they could listen to the candidates themselves they could even in many of these forms propose questions um but i have to tell you it's usually just a very small percentage yeah. of population that does that which and is I, why I'm, i like door to door yeah i understand that uh i'm i'm a little bit older so i come from a more simple era where things are more black and white and less gray uh when i was running for county commission I was approached by someone that was willing to run some ads for me. They said, I got the impression the type of ads they're going to run. There were going to be negative ads against my opponent. I said, I don't want this. We're not going to do that. So they never were run. Do you as a candidate, I know you're not supposed to have direct con uh, communication with these PACs, but can you not influence the PACs not to run the campaign, not to, not to run the negative ads? 
You have you have a lot of influence as a candidate. Yeah, well, if they were to ask me my opinion, they'd know where I stand. But if the facts started coming out, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm pressing you on this, uh, Patricia, but I'm doing it for you as representative of all the candidates, not just you. Right, I understand. But if the first time a negative ad came out, and if you approached the pack and said, I don't want to have any part of that, I do not want the ads to run, wouldn't that be a step in the right direction? Are you even allowed to reach out to the pack? Though, Bill, I, I don't think as a candidate you, you're even allowed to actually reach out to a PAC. Uh, so I will tell you that you're not supposed to have any communication with right. them. I also will tell you that I do not shy away from letting folks know where I stand when it comes to the campaign and how I approach it. The, if folks want to give money, I prefer they give it directly to me because I feel like I know exactly what, you know, is the best use of that money for, to help me get elected. If you support me, please give me that money. But there are still going to be individuals who prefer to give it to another organization of which I don't have a say. I don't know yeah. who even is on their boards to these PACs. Um, now, if I know someone who is involved in the PAC, I will let them know, like, this is the way that I campaign. This is what I prefer yeah. to do, and I prefer yeah. to stick to the issues. Yeah. But and and I grouped uh, packs and super packs right. in the same brush. I think they they operate differently. Right. Yeah. So, so Patricia, I I've heard and I I, I know for a, you are probably the the most uh, effective door to door campaigner out there. What is the perspective of the voter and why do you think our turnout is so low are, are people telling you that they're just not interested or what is your perspective on that unfortunately a lot do tell me that they're not interested that they've kind of lost faith in the entire system the, that's, they, that's they, horrible it is horrible and it's one of the reasons for why again i I'm hoping that the debates that um, John and I are going to have and the fact that we do respect each other and we, you know, I'm hoping it brings back a little bit of faith in it because folks don't like the negative. They don't like the attacks. They, they just feel like all sides are dirty. And the only way we change that is to have, obviously, candidates and elected officials who don't participate in that and who are what I would... My goal and aim is to be a statesman, you know, um, and to bring that back. But then in addition to that, I will say where we live particularly, we are influenced by the national politics more than other areas, I think, of West Virginia. So there's a lot of folks, the only thing they watch is national politics. Because TV. geographically and... Yeah, we're so close to D.C. A lot of them work in yep. D.C., metropolitan areas, and... So all they really look at and know is those type of politics. And when I come to their door, they don't even know what the what state senator bad. does. And, <laughs> you know, that sort of rings true to me because, you know, you look and you listen to people. And the reality is, is the turnout such as abysmal as it is, is higher in a year when we presidential. have a presidential race at the top of the ticket. And I'll never forget many, many years ago, Jay Rockefeller sitting in the journal conference room saying to me, and he was a United States senator at the time, he said, you want to make a difference in your community, Maria, you run for school board. And what he was saying is the you know the the grassroots the where you really have an impact is the the local races and unfortunately like you say people just don't either aren't interested don't pay attention say that doesn't that's not going to make any difference to me well heck yeah that's where it makes the most difference and well, i was um, guilty of the same thing so i worked so hard for all those years to become a citizen to have that right to vote and i will never forget going into that ballot box and i knew who to vote for president i knew who to vote for congress and i'm like oh my goodness what are all these other who are all these other people? And yeah. that was one of the reasons that I started the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. I want to know who the f names are and know who to vote for. And, you know, I vote for the person. I don't vote for the party. So, so you, um, both Mike and Bill, alluded to the door-to-door the -door, um, campaigning that you do. In this 
reconfiguration of your district. I mean, that's a lot of miles, <laughs> Senator. Um, so how do you, I mean, do you try and constrain yourself to particular neighborhoods or subdivisions and do you get a lot of people answering the door do they throw coffee in your face or anything <laughs> so um a lot of questions there oh, sorry um, sorry it's okay i will tell you that i'm actually one of the luckiest state senators i only have a, a one full county and mm -hmm. a portion of a okay, second county can. there's a lot of state senators that have two three four five counties i i'm so i, I can't complain really <laughs> about yeah we, we can't really complain here in the east of Panama. Our, our districts are really condensed, compact because right? yeah. mm -hmm. of the population yeah. um but in terms of you know i will again Yes, uh, there are some people who are not at home. I do try to plan my door knocking for when most people are at home, but there's always going to be some people at home. There are folks that work from home, and there's retired folks, and there's stay-at-home folks, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, you do the best you can. When someone's not home, I leave them a door card with a little note and ask them to call me, although very few do. Um, and then, of course, yes, you've got the negative responses and the positive responses i will tell you overall it's mostly positive folks appreciate that you're taking the time to come talk to them and listen to them and um they you know they share what the concerns are uh, or it, sometimes i don't have any concern i'm really happy that's great okay good to hear um but then you get the folks who slam the door in the face or call your names and you know but let's go let's go to issues for a few minutes if sure. we can uh what are some of the issues like uh, three questions and they kind of group together vine of uh, the end of the diagram the issues that are important to the jefferson county and berkeley county the issues that you and john agree with and the issues that you and john disagree with you really want me to list all that? No, no, no. no. I just and I finish would. in about eight minutes. Well, no, actually, actually, there are probably not very many that uh, you could probably do that in just a couple of minutes. I, I don't know about that. I will tell you that in terms of the issues Jefferson and Berkeley County are concerned with, it's the, a lot of them are the same ones year after year after year. Yes. The roads, mm -hmm. the population growth, the infrastructure, schools. Um, and then this year in particular, I think um, the solar facilities mm -hmm. in Jefferson County is kind of a top issue. Um, in Berkeley County, really, folks are not happy about traffic. I don't know what to tell you. We, okay, traffic, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm just yeah. saying. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and I've also had folks express concern about um, the fact that there's so few activities to do. You know, they're looking for more opportunities. Um, so... You know, that's kind of, you get that when you talk to folks. And then there's always those folks that just have that particular issue. And, and actually, very often I can help them. There are folks that's like, can, you know. It's a I'm, very specific issue that you can actually. Yeah, that I can about. tell them, mm -hmm. oh, this is who you contact yeah. to get that resolved or whatever. Um, and then in terms of issues that John and I agree on, I mean. I don't know if I can really list all of them, but we've worked together on, you know, legislation before. He, as you know, he was a lobbyist for some time. And things that we agree on is, you know, local control, uh, you know, as much as we can, try to encourage local government, um, you know, protecting, um, having clean air, you know, clean water, um, those type of issues we've worked together on. Um, we both agree on civics and you know getting engaged and educated voters and um it's funny we've done t i don't know if you know this together we've been invited to do classes um at shepherd where we both talk to the students that are doing um you know learning about politics yeah, and things like yeah. that and um it's always a lot of fun to do that yeah. i really enjoy that you, local control this is something that we hear quite a bit from the uh, representatives, but once they get to Charleston, they're a little reluctant to give up <laughs> the county local control. <laughs> what is your position on that? Well, actually, I I walked the walk. I uh, I was the person who passed a bill that finally gave the school boards some authority over their budgets, over what they could do, um, and get, and really empowered them. 
Having said that, I was, you know, talking recently with Delegate Hornby about the fact that most school systems are not taking advantage of that. And, and we heard yesterday um, that the local school board actually just voted to increase the um, housing allowance, right? And, and I believe you were instrumental in that bill that overhauled the education to allow those uh, rules to, to be. Do you know if there's a limit on how, how much they can raise that housing allowance? There is no limit. So they have about 70% flexibility in the funds that we send them from the state state, yeah. um, their school funding, 70% flexibility where they can prioritize, they can decide. This is how we're going to set the budget up. And if their priority is to pay for better quality teachers, yep. um, that's what they can do now, which they weren't able to do before. So, so in effect, we've gotten around uh, locality pay. Yes. In effect, I basically got around locality pay. Okay. What the term that yeah. was used in that bill was that you can pay in air, more in areas of high turnover, which areas of high turnover include, of course, the Eastern Panhandle, but also include very rural areas of the state where they lose teachers just because they're so rural. It's very difficult to attract young people who are looking for more exciting places to live. So that language gives the ability for all school systems that have high turnover to be able to do that. Even if they don't have the excess levy or a bond or, or something like that? So it, we're talking about the state funding. It yeah, is not is, related. So they can so, use the state funding yes. to get that. They don't only have to use their excess levy funds. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so it's so this is great. So they uh, so the the complaint about locality pay, even though we'll still hear complaint about it, but you have fixed it in large part. Well, so we've given them that opportunity. To Having fix it. Yeah. said that, yeah. you know they're needing to be more money. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a yeah. different issue, yeah. of course. Yeah. Always going back to this uh, uh, to the county as well as board of education. The question I ask second go home rule. Are you supportive of home rule for the counties? Um, up to a certain point. Okay, explain. Well, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Like one of the things that um, we do when we go down to Charleston is we balance, right? We have a balance between the desires of this group and this group. Um, I definitely support there being, um, you know, more authority on the local government which is closer to the people in some things but then there's things i'm sorry no you're not gonna <laughs> do so well let me back up just a second what really has bothered me over the years is that i've heard so much complaint from our legislators about washington keeping control they they have the thumb on the state but the state legislators do exactly the same thing to the local level. In fact, you don't trust the local local uh, government to do the job. So Phil, you know how to do it better than they do. There's two yeah. issues there okay. because when, and I can't speak for everyone you've heard, mm -hmm. but when folks complain about the Washington controlling yeah. things, yeah. I think the vast majority of the complaints is when Washington is trying to control things that it is not in their constitutional authority to control. So the U.S. Constitution tells the feds, this is your limited role and everything else belongs to the states. When we, as state elected officials, we must be very jealous of the authority that we were given and protected. And that includes, we delegate some to the counties, we delegate some to the municipalities, but remember, that authority is in the states, not in the counties and in the local governments. So when we give them, when we say, yes, we're, we're going to let you have the authority to do X, Y, and C, that doesn't mean that we, the state, are saying, okay, you guys can do whatever you want. It is definitely a very thoughtful process of this is what your role is because we still have the ultimate responsibility according to the U.S. Constitution and our own West Virginia Constitution. We got about 20 seconds, Patricia. What would you like to tell our audience before we leave you this morning? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah, your 20 seconds stump speech. Go for it. Well, um, I really would love to have you all vote and support. I will tell you that I've had the pleasure of serving for eight years. I've worked really hard to serve the constituents of this area. I feel that I'm very responsive and ready. They can call me on my cell phone, which is on my website, 
Rucker for WV.com. Um, and they are, can also reach out to me in many social media platforms. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Bill and Maria. We're going to be right back after this.